what was the most memorable, the most painful, the most um, insight laden challenge you had to overcome to bring this to life? Well, the first thing for me was making someone care about their thermostat. <laughs> right. No one considers it. <laughs> they never had any customer choice. They right. didn't install it. They usually don't even use it because it's so complicated or what have you. They just like, <laughs> they just, they bitch at it. They hide it in the corner yeah. and then they just pay the bill, right? Of whatever it is, right? It's totally unloved, unconsidered, right? So how do you wake up, like I said, the virus of doubt, how do you wake that up and get people going, you know, remember every day when you go in and it's like, you're just frustrated and then you get the bill and you pay the bill. So you have to do that. So that was one thing. I think the other big one was not delivering, you know, it was, all of it was hard, right? It was constrained. We had only so much stuff. We were bootstrapped. We didn't have massive funding. We didn't get hundreds of millions of dollars. It was, but we did it for the right reasons. But I think the other big part of it was not just building a disruptive product because a lot of the people on the team had done that. We knew what we were doing. And, and, and that was, if we got the design right, we could deliver it with uh, the, uh, um, enough time. It was getting the disruptive go to market. In other words, how to take that product from the end of the production line and get it into the customer's hands because there was no retail or customer choice in thermostats. No one even, it was never a considered purchase. They never thought they had choice. Some guy, usually in suspenders and a butt crack, told them, <laughs> looked around, looked yeah. at their house and said, um, this looks like somebody who's got, is well to do. This thermostat is now gonna cost you $350, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, I'll take whatever you give me, right? And then and it goes into another house, it's worth $100, but it's the same damn thing, yeah. right? So there was no price transparency, there was no choice, you just got what you were given. So how do you go, and, and, and this was an entrenched industry, that's why there was no, in, it, there was no innovation in it. Mm -hmm. Because it was doing just fine, because every house needed them. The, all the installers were programmed by the, the product deliverers, by you know, bonuses, and, and, and bonuses to say, you're gonna only carry our product, and if you sell this many, you're gonna get a free trip to Hawaii. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And for these guys who install, I get a free trip to Hawaii. That's dream for them. Right. So this whole channel was fully controlled by the product guys. And it was almost monopolistic in a way. So how do you go around that? So creating a disruptive go to market channel, one was direct to consumer, right. And all the marketing that was necessary to get that message across. Another one was getting the installation, right. No one was self-installing thermostats. So how do we get enough people who are early adopters to be able to self-install them confidently so they didn't still have to call the guy mm -hmm. to come and install it because then he would say, this is a crap product. No, I got the much better product, right? Yeah. So you had to get rid of that friction. And then ultimately, how do you get the people who were not just early adopters, but people who needed to see it and touch it before they bought it? How do you get that into retail when the large brands of the time of thermostats and Home Depot and Lowe's had contracts that they couldn't bring in any other brands. Mm -hmm. They were owning the channel all the way to where there was an, any sort of slight customer choice. And it was really um, contractor choice more than it was end consumer choice. So all of that had to be in, innovated along with the product. And so to me, that was a huge challenge and something I had never done, most of us had never done, and we had to, to, to create, that was as much as a project as actually delivering the, the product itself. So it turned out to be a giant hit. <laughs> uh, and it was acquired by Google for $3.2 billion. As a founder and leader, just out of curiosity, in these cases of acquisition, um, is it always a good thing? Is there any part of you and the team that considers saying no? Oh, we considered saying no all the way along the process, right? We had all been in big companies before. Um, we knew what it was like and the politics and all the other stuff. And what I came to learn, 
especially uh, you know, from Phillips, because Phillips was a very, it was 375,000 people. It was a big, it was a massive company, right? And tons of politics. And I was like, do we want to go back into that world? Because I had so many negative experiences from that. But then going to Apple, which was, you know, not big, but it was big enough that it could have all these dynamics. But then when you saw a leader rise up and get rid of those dynamics or not allow many of them to, to flourish, then you're like, oh, with the right leadership, this can be a beautiful marriage, right? And so for four months, we were working together with them, with Google, to make sure that we had the right leadership and we were gonna be in the right environment that it felt right. So that happened. It absolutely happened. We worked on all the details. We didn't even talk about price. We were talking about how's the brand going to work? Who's the team going to work with? How are we going to get IP? How are we going to do exchanges? How are we going to get budgets and all that stuff done? So we worked through all of that before we actually sealed any kind of deal because they were already an investor in the company. So we already knew, you know, they knew relatively where their, you know, the end point was for the price. So working through all those prerequisites, I knew that as a individual product company that was trying to create a platform, no investors were gonna invest in a platform that could take three, four years and many, many hundreds of millions of dollars to build without all kinds of new products at the same time. And products that we were having, which were successes, but they weren't even break even yet, right? We were still developing them. So how are we gonna get more people to fund all of these things and this platform that I really wanna create? Because my worry, and I had seen this many times in Silicon Valley, is these small startups have bravado and they said, I'm gonna take on the big guys, right? With a platform. But when those platform guys show up and Apple says they're gonna get in the, at the time, nobody cared. They were, they were curiously, yeah, it's curious, what's next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> Apple wasn't in the market. Google wasn't in the market yet. Amazon wasn't there. Microsoft, Samsung, they were not, they were all just, mm, that's curious. Mm -hmm. right <laughs> yeah and i had watched if you said i'm going to go challenge them and i'm going to build a platform and then they all of a sudden one by one go oh well we're building a platform now we're building a platform they fudded you to death fear yeah. uncertainty doubt yeah. and the developers run away and you can't make that platform so i'm like before the landscape gets changed on us because we're tracked so much attention they announce something we need to ch change the landscape on them Let's go to the best place where we can build out the platform, have the right leadership behind us to help us grow this thing into what the vision it should be. And that's what we believe we were doing with the, the Google acquisition. Is it possible to take on the platforms? So you said there's a lot of startups with bravado and all that kind of stuff. Right. Doesn't mean, you know, James Joyce, when he was 20 said, I'm gonna be the greatest writer of the 20th century. <laughs> Uh, before we wrote anything of, of value. Um, you know, one of them is, might be actually right. <laughs> um, yeah, in this modern world, when you, so first of all, people should definitely uh, get your book, Build, it has just just a, this giant number of advice on this exact question of how to build cool things, <laughs> how to build a startup, how to all the different stages of that team and hiring. And it's mostly so, human nature. It's not technical. It's mostly human yes. nature behind it. And it turns out it's, you know, turtles all the way down this human at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> yes, so is it possible to build startups that take on the big guys, uh, whatever that is of, of the modern era? So for now, it's these platforms of, uh, Apple, Google, Twitter, I don't even know, Meta, Meta I guess, called now. Sure. Um, is it possible to take them on? Absolutely. But you don't take them on on their same turf. You take them on on the turf they're gonna want to have in the future, right? Spotify is a platform. It started as an application, is now a platform, Yeah. right? Yeah. Think of WeChat. Think of all the super apps out there that are now wallets and delivery services and travel services and, and transportation services all within an app. Yeah, They've innovated in a different level, in a different space that the, the platform companies weren't, right? Or they, you know, Google was an app, it was an app company. It was solving Perfect. search <laughs> and then it became a platform company. Apple was solving personal computing and then it became, or iPhone was doing, you know, uh, 
um, solving internet browsing and all that stuff. And then it became a platform company when the app store was added. If you look at it, there's no such thing as building a platform company. You build a great app first, and then you can expand it and have the right to become a platform. 